distant, dark, expansive, mysterious, forbidding. This is Russia. This is Russia, how so many of us on the outside know it. And yet, within this amazing land, a people who are tru truly beautiful, a culture which is truly glorious, there are riches to be found. And what I want to do in my time with you today is share those riches by asking you to join me to engage and touch the Russian soul. The word distant is the word I want to emphasize as I begin my remarks. And I want to note in the distance that separates those of us on the outside from Russia, that the distance is not only physical, geographic, it is psychological, it is psychic. And it has seemingly been ever true of the Russians that they were removed from the rest of us. So here I am in the American Southwest, 11 time zones away from Moscow, but now in the 21st century, you and I can be from the Southwest in Russia in, a, in 15 hours. So distance has shrunk, though it was always there. And when the Marquis de Castine, the 18th century diplomat, was posted to the court of Catherine the Great, and he wrote his magnificent memoir, A Journey for Our Time, and he discusses the logic and the experience of going from Paris through many lands and many peoples, ultimately reaching the borders of the Russian Empire, but so far yet to go before he reached the court at St. Petersburg. He gives to the reader the sense of this distance, and yet even more importantly, one feels the distance psychologically, socially, that he encountered. And so it is still true now. You can be there in 15 hours, but here we are in the 21st century, and so much has changed, but somehow the distance psychically is still there. And so I want to ask of you, as you join me in trying to engage Russia, I want to ask you to let go of two things for a moment. Don't throw them away, don't deny them, but I want to remove two barnacles that impact us when we engage Russia. One barnacle is the barnacle of history, the difficult history we've had with Russia. I'm not going to discuss who is responsible for what. I am a political scientist. I know this history. It's complicated. I, I cast no aspersion on anyone, but it is difficult. And in the end, it has affected us. And so in a sense, it helps hinder. I, it really limits our ability to grab that soul when we so focus on the history and the difficulties that we've had. And the second thing I ask you to do is set aside the barnacle of horror and evil that we associate with the Russian lands because horrific and evil things have occurred there. Knowing that in our common human experience, evil and horror sadly has gone where we have gone. I'm in the Americas. And I know, and you know, in the history of the Americas, North and South and Australia, what happened when the European peoples met the native peoples. We know what happened in Africa and Europe over the millennia as nations met one another with ferocity and violence. We know what the great empires of Asia did as they rose, the horrors and evils. There's no monopoly on horror or evil in Russia. There's nothing unique about it in that regard. But we know of Stalinism. It was recent in our human experience, and it, it's off-putting to us. Set it aside. Set it aside. Don't deny it. It was a crucible that helped create the Russian soul. Because if there's one message I want to share about Russia, when, I, when you ask of me, why do I really care? Why would I want to think about the Russian soul? I would tell you this, because it offers a treasure trove of human experience. Because in their suffering, Russians have great virtue great morals, great honor. This is a heroic people, and we don't see this through the complexity of history, through the complexity of moments of great evil. I want to share my own journey of, with Russia to give you a sense of how one can touch that soul. It began when I was eight, when my dad gave me a present coming back from a, a business trip to New York City. He gave me a record, a recording of Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf, this glorious music, hardly childish, even if it's based in a child tale. It's magnificent orchestral music. But, and I always wondered, Dad, 
you know, why did you give me a record on Russian music? I, the name is Willerton. We're English. I mean, we have no, there's no Slavic or Russian blood in these veins. There was no special interest in Russia. And I know why he did it, probably. It's because when he got that record, he got a remainder. He got two for one. Dad was always looking for a deal. And thank God he got the remainder because it wasn't Prokofiev. It was the other record. It was the Soviet Army and Chorus Band record. It was the record that had the big red star. It had to be red. It's Soviet. And there were no liner notes. And so what did I have as an eight-year-old? I had the names of the 18 songs or so, and they were, and, and maybe a one-sentence description. And the, and the songs were <coughs> of, of, of the history of the country, the folk songs. They were of what the Russians call the Great October Revolution, what we call the Russian Revolution. They were of the Great Patriotic War, what we call World War II. It was magnificent music. It was muscular. It was expansive. There was great feeling and poignancy. One ensemble, the buoyancy of those 75 to 90 members of the Soviet army as they were singing. Or the lone voice, the poignant voice, alone with an accordion or with one instrument, singing of his sweetheart, singing of his love for his country. It was all there, every sort of emotion. And I was off, and I was running with this unique Russia. And this happened in the year of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And somehow I never related that to this. My sisters didn't appreciate the music as it was booming. They were into other things, and they gave me a hard time. I got kind of a weird brother. He's in there listening to Soviet <coughs> military and folk songs, and they're off with the Beatles or whatever. But so, uh, so be it, so be it. And then two years later, I came upon a fantastic quarter, uh, a weekly magazine I don't know what it was. I tried to find it. There's six pictures of stern people in a circle with a question mark in the middle. <coughs> they were Soviet leaders. Nikita Khrushchev, the great strong man, had been ousted. And no one knew why. And there was the mystery. And there were these unknown leaders. And I looked at that, and I just found Russia was a puzzle. And the puzzle came in for me. I just wanted to know more. And so, as Churchill said in 1939, Russia is a riddle, wrapped in a mystery, set in an enigma. This is what I found. It was true then, it was true in the 18th, 19th century, it's true now, it's still true now. And so for me the puzzle was there and I found it so intriguing. But the kicker came with one more event. Growing up in Columbus, Ohio, my mom took me down to Ohio State on two successive <coughs> weekends when I was 14 to see the eight-hour Soviet film of War and Peace, Leo Tolstoy's masterpiece. You know, this is maybe the greatest piece of Russian literature. I happen to think it's the greatest piece of literature of our civilization. You who like Dickens, you who like Victor Hugo, you have a good case to be made, but I'll stick with Tolstoy. And what Tolstoy does in this amazing novel that's set in Napoleonic times, as Napoleon is invading Russia. He deals with the biggest issues of life. In 1,400 pages, he creates a world, 100 major characters, six major families, issues of war and peace, life and death, God, the meaning of life. And for me, I'll admit, I didn't read the 1,400-page book first. I guess we're not supposed to, we're supposed to you know, read and then see the movie. I saw the movie first, and in eight hours, through two successive Sundays, I was drawn in, and I really began to engage the Russian soul. And I met three Russians that I want to tell you about, iconic figures from that novel. And let me say, as I encourage you to see the movie or to read the novel, don't be put off by the names. If the translation is good, those hundred characters with this complicated name system that the Russians have, the first, the middle, the last, it will all be there. Don't let, again, a distance because of a different norm. These are beautiful people. They're iconic. So I want to tell you about three that are iconic. I want to tell you about Prince Andrei Balkonsky. Balkonsky, who is the dashing hero in his 30s, the, he, the heroic figure who is strong and solid and virtuous, patriotic, Yes, perhaps at times wooden. Yes, perhaps bullheaded in some ways. But a good man who is in love with his country as he is in love with his friends in his life. His friend Pierre Bezukhov, the count, a bear of a man, large, uh, clumsy, socially awkward, yet he is in 
the nobility. He is in the palaces because he is rich and he comes from a named family, even if he himself is a clumsy soul. But he is a good man. He is virtuous. If he's an egghead, if he's an intellectual, if he's awkward, yet he has much to offer, he has much to reflect upon. And he and Andrei Volkonsky interact. They are very close friends, and they learn from each other as they face the world. These are faces of Russians, the Russian soul. And then the young Natasha Rostova, and we see her in the movie first running in a field. Can you imagine it? Open up your mind now. Let your mind eye, mind's eye open to you. I'm not showing pictures. I want to share some words. I want to join your images of Russia. If you set aside the barnacles that I've mentioned, I want to join them with other images. Imagine Natasha Rostova, 15, running through a beautiful field, the beautiful uh, birch trees in the background, the wildflowers. A, woman, a young woman who is chaste, who is virginal, who is of nature, who is pure, who is innocent, who is naive, but a, ahead of her lies a life of great challenge, of great suffering, and yet of great growth. And her life will intersect with the other two, and the three of them through a massive story will offer many insights as they suffer, as they grow as people. Let me tell you about a Russian style I noticed in the movie sitting there that I find when I think of Russians. I live in a country, I live in a culture that tends to be talkative. And I noticed in the Russian film, people aren't always talking. And much is communicated through eyes, through glances, through gestures. The beauty of silence. I see the Russians often as a silent people. Sure, you can be at the table with your dear ones, having a beverage, the food flowing, the conversation is rich, they're quite talkative. But on the other hand, in many ways they are quiet people. Is it because they are of the forest, what they call the taiga? Is it the, of, of the plains, that they call, um, 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 well, the plains? You know, both, both in the plains, uh, the steppe. I was looking for the word steppe. The steppe, the steppe, the taiga. These are nature is powerful. It encourages simplicity. It, it, but it encourages a quiet. But but quiet does not mean thoughtfulness. Still waters do run deep, and they run deep in Russia. So I want you to engage this and understand that in these people there are interesting lessons to be learned. There are insights in life that can be felt. How does one do this? Well, this is very personal. Can I tell you what the Russian soul is? I've, I've shared characteristics. I've shared them through the pieces that drew me in. I can't define it because Russia, in the personality of its population, in its character, is as vast as the territory. There's no prototypical Russian, as there is not a prototypical American or German or Japanese. But what I would say is this. In, in the logic of simplicity, in the logic of emotion, in the logic of what can, one can learn through suffering, as the Russians have suffered, remembering that their terrain is harsh, that their climate is unforgiving, and that they have been ringed by peoples with whom they've had complicated relations. You look at the map in your lifetime, my lifetime, and Russia is the giant, and these are the dwarves. But the truth is, if you go back over the thousand or more years of Russian history, <coughs> Russia was small, and it was small city-states. And Poland-Lithuania was powerful, as was Sweden, as was Germany, as was France, the Ottoman Empire, the glorious Persian civilization, great China, Mongolia, all of these. And they've all had intimate dealings with the Russians. They cause pain as they've been pained. And so you see the suffering that has been the crucible of the creation of Russians is all of these things, terrain, climate, and neighboring peoples, complex history. I don't, however, when I talk about suffering, want to leave you in the image of some uh, depressed people. This is a joyous people. This is a spirited people, a people that value family and friendship, but in their quiet ways, for you and me on the outside, sometimes hard to engage. You know, I hope, in sharing comments with you who are not of Russia, like me, that I can open up a bit your sense that there is so much more there, that the rivers do run deep, the treasures are endless. And for any who are listening to me who are Russian, I hope my words, as a foreigner, as an American who discovered Russia at eight, but who is not Russian? As my Russian friend said to me, Pat, you're such an American. 
And I took it fairly because you're such an individual. And I got my greatest compliment at the end of my year living in the Soviet Union in 1983. This was the year that Reagan described the Soviet Union as the evil empire. This was the time when Brezhnev died and Andropov came in. It was an amazing year. And my friend Volodya, one of my two best friends, he was a musician. The other best friend, Alexei, was a member of the Communist Party. We both were great people that I learned about the Russian soul. And we were out, Volodya and I, walking a one last big walk as I was saying goodbye, these were the air, it was an era where I couldn't be in touch with them when, when we left. And so we were having our wine, our cheese, our bread, our sausage. And he turned and he said, Pat, I just got to tell you something. You speak Russian like a Pole. And I was so excited because, frankly, we Americans, we don't speak Russian so well in their mind. I tried. I work hard. But you work with me? And I descended to be a Pole. <laughs> so what I say to you is touch the Russian soul. Find it through the arts, through the history. Find it through the visual arts. You know Chabal, you know Kandinsky. Dive into it, dance. My daughter, who studied ballet for 12 years, I became a ballet dad. She pulled me into ballet. George Balanchine, all the great dancers. When you see the great Russian ballerina, prima ballerina, Maya Plisetskaya, when you see Maya Plisetskaya dance the dying swan, this is a beautiful piece. The music is by Camille Sasson, a great French composer from the Carnival of the Animals. And when she dances in this four-minute elegy to the swan, and I want to get to the floor, but I won't be able to get back up. I don't know how to do this. But she, she, she is gorgeous. She's elegant. She's the swan. And she starts with her pride, the beauty of her life, and she begins to pulled down as she's died, and she ends up on the floor covered. It is beautiful, and when you see in this death, and you can go online, you'll, you can watch Maya Plisetskaya dance the dying swan. In her death, you see the celebration of life. And to me, this is the reality of Russia. Yes, suffering too, but great accomplishment. So you could go that route as well. You could go the route of dance. I went the route of music. Rachmaninoff, Stravinsky, Prokofiev, Shostakovich. No people gave us so many great composers in the 20th century. But it's Shostakovich I turned to. When I was exposed to the Fifth Symphony, it drew me to Russia. And then I met the other symphonies, all 15. And when you dive into those 15 symphonies, what you will do is you will encounter 40 years of the creativity of a genius that will open up to you the history of Russia because it all was there. Here was Shostakovich having to survive Stalinism and somehow he did. But now in my life, I await diving into the, the string quartets that are personal, that are intimate. I'm in my late 50s, I'm ready. I've waited all my life. I'm going to, I've heard them all, but I'm going to go through them one by one, 40 years of Russia. This is his soul. The quartets bring you the soul of the man, I would argue, the soul of Russia. OK, I'm winding up. I would say to you, I hope you will consider engaging the Russian soul. But as I speak simply 50 miles from Mexico, I will tell you there are other glorious souls one to our south from Arizona in Mexico, and the glorious Persian civilization, and great China. Everything I'm sharing, you could use to touch the soul of another great people. <coughs> but I encourage you to go to Russia. And in this regard, I want to end with two verses from a beautiful poem. And I'm not a Russian now, because if I were a Russian, I would not be reading this. I would have it in my heart and in my head, and I would recite it. So I'm going to share with you a brief poem. And, and sharing this with you, to tell you that silence is good, that reflection is good, that still waters run deep, that the Russian soul is a treasure trove, I want you to hear in this poem a voice that is speaking from Fyodor Kuchev, a poet of the 19th century, to you, but also to me and to the Russians. Speak not, lie hidden and conceal the way you dream, the things you feel. Deep in your spirit let them rise, akin to stars in crystal skies that set before the night is blurred, delight in them and speak no word. Live in your inner soul alone. Within your soul a world has grown, the magic of veiled thoughts that might be blinded by the outer light, drowned in the noise of day, unheard. Take in their song and speak no word. 
Seek the Russian soul. When you touch it, you will touch your own. Thank you.